uh, uh, Anchita is from Bangalore and uh, Debashri is from Bengal. Yes. Yes, okay. Yes, so you can uh, introduce and start if 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 she's coming, no, Mrs. Uh, I mean, uh... mm. Pritha, 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 Pritha told that yes, she would come, ma'am. She told okay. that she would come. Okay, then just give her a ring and we'll. Oh, okay. She told me too that she would be there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Sorry for keeping you waiting. I was trying to open from my laptop and I couldn't uh, open. So I'm logging into my phone. So good evening and welcome to this edition of uh, In Tandem, where our theme is eco-criticism. And uh, we have uh, three uh, members in a panel for discussion on the theme of eco-criticism and three illustrious people, I should say, people who have in-depth knowledge of the subject area. Our chairperson for this evening is uh, Dr. Srilata, retired professor and head uh, Chelamal's College for Women. And uh, of the panel, let me introduce the panelists to you. Uh, Dr. Debashi Datare from Jadavpur University. Welcome, Dr. De Debashi. And uh, Anchita Krishna, who's a member of faculty at Christ University. Welcome, Anchita. Thank you, ma'am. And you. I would like to welcome my own colleague, Mrs. Sumati, who has also done her PhD on eco-criticism. And uh, without further ado, I would like to hand over to our chairperson of the evening, who has also specialized in this field. And uh, she, in turn, will hand over to the panelists of the evening. Uh, thank you for yes. waiting for me, and I hope I hope we have a fruitful session together. Yes. Good evening. A very good evening to all of you, and thank you for inviting me to chair this session. Of course, uh, my uh, my knowledge of eco criticism, I think, is about. Uh, two years too rusty because I haven't since retirement I haven't done much reading okay so for me 
today i have come to be edified at this session i know i am i am i am with the first three waves of eco criticism i haven't gone into the fourth wave but i think the fourth wave of eco criticism uh, which is actually you know uh, uh, writing stories from stories that matter to the physical environment we have come to storied matter right we have come to materialist eco criticism i know very briefly on that i haven't read many article except just one or two of those very uh, seminal ones which was very difficult for me because for one, one is all so eco ecological criticism has come back to you know breaking down all dualisms we have come to the position where one is all and all is one so we have to realize that oneness instead of seeing the diversity okay uh, i mean I, of course acknowledging the diversities we have here we have no more diversities we are all all dualisms all uh, i think diverse is one and we are all one and the same now we realize that and with that knowledge when we go to do what we have been doing in eco criticism that is the relationship uh, examining the relationship of the human and the non human maybe the, the the last refuge that we have the earth the only planet we have will be safe maybe for the future generations we hope we have a more understanding on so many things now and perhaps this will help us you know consciously save the uh, universe so with that note shall i call on the first uh, speaker anchita she is supposed to have gone places she has uh, she is a nehru uh, right yes okay. fellowship yes and she, she was at idaho university yes and she's done a whole lot of papers on toxicology and all that so let us listen i've uh, it it's the bio note i mean that sent i have to open it up it i have to read it out and let because uh, no she's talking about what she's talking what she is i that also was sent to me you are talking about the fourth wave right T today yes, yes yes today you will be talking about the fourth wave um so good i think it that will be a uh, that that will be a seminal uh, thing for many of us okay mm. shall i begin ma'am yes yes you can please do yeah. i the rest of about her i will tell you ah, i've got it now mm. okay <laughs> she has presented her research work at various international she's a fulbright nehru doctoral fellow at the uh, idaho Uni university university of idaho her interests are climate change narratives popular culture and uh, american literature i think she has even worked on the our i mean uh, she has investigated perhaps the the bhopal uh, tragedy okay in uh, the book what is that uh, dela hunt's red book that And is my translation. latest publication yes okay right transnational interconnections of nature studies and the environmental humanities right in yes it that that's a paper that's a right? chapter in book. that collection yes okay right toxic scapes and new sensibilities narrating bopal in megan uh, dela hunts the red book yeah that is my that latest is book. publication a book chapter yes and now yes. you are going to speak on just material for the material eco criticism i will go through the first three waves mm. and then focus yes. on the material eco yes criticism in particular okay i have a ppt to share please let mm. me know if the ppt is uh, visible mm. okay uh i hope 
hope it is visible. Yes. So this is uh, my topic today, mm -hmm. that is material eco-criticism, the fourth wave of eco-criticism. Uh, before uh, using the wave metaphor, uh, I would, this is a disclaimer that many of the uh, theoreticians and academicians working in eco-criticism uh, have actually spoken against using a wave metaphor. Uh, and I will speak on it a little later. But uh, for today's topic, uh, I have taken a material eco-criticism, which is the current uh, buzzword, uh, if, I, if I may say so, in eco-criticism. So when you look at the waves of eco-criticism or the developments, the major developments uh, in the field of uh, ecological inquiry, you could see that uh, ecological uh, ecocriticism if you if you go for a definition it can be called a scrutiny of ecological implications and human nature relationships in any literary text so that is one of the way to define ecocriticism and as you might have already read and uh, understood that ecocriticism has been uh, defined in various ways uh, by various uh, eco-critics and uh, theoreticians. So one a way of looking at eco-criticism is to understand it as a scrutiny of ecological implications and human nature relationships in any literary text. Now, when you look at the ways in which this academic inquiry has developed or this academic scrutiny has developed over the years, uh, Lawrence Buell, one of the famous eco-critics, have uh, identified or used the wave metaphor, which of course he has taken from the uh, feminism movement and the waves of feminism. So he has uh, suggested using the wave metaphor in order to uh, understand or in order to uh, differentiate the various levels of development uh, in eco-criticism. So uh, if you look at the first wave, you could see that in the first wave of uh, eco-criticism, uh, there was a, a, uh, the writings or the focus was on uh, nature in the sense that nature was celebrated and it was focused more on preservation and that too preservation of a particular kind of uh, uh, ecosystem or environment that is wilderness uh, and something that is uh, pristine, uh, uh, quote unquote. So this idea of nature culture binary was very well established in this first wave of eco-criticism. And uh, it was mostly focused on the Anglo-American uh, uh, Anglo-American texts. Uh, and uh, so this is the first wave of development as observed by Lawrence Buell. But when we move on to the second wave of development, you could see that many of this, uh, as uh, Ma'am mentioned in her introduction, many of these dualisms that we had in the beginning began to break. The first is the nature cultural, nature culture binary. It sort of began to break. We could see that uh, all of these uh, Cartesian ideas of uh, Cartesian dualisms and binaries sort of beginning to break and we are able to expand our notion of the environment as such. So in the in the earlier days of eco-criticism or when you look at the early writings of uh, environment and ecology, you could see that when we talk about nature or when we talk about environment, we are we were only talking about or those writers were only talking about a, a particular kind of environment. So what second wave writers or the writers uh, or the texts uh, in the second wave of eco-criticism, what they did was to expand the idea of uh, environment as such to include the urban and suburban environments. And with this inclusion, there also came a lot of uh, sociological concerns and environmental justice itself was part of this uh, second wave of uh, eco-criticism. Now coming to this problematics of wave metaphor, uh, when, you see, when you call it a wave metaphor, you, you would assume that there is a neat succession or a neat or clear uh, transition 
between these two waves, but it is not so. Uh, as you can see, if you if you observe the eco-critical movement itself, you could see that uh, nothing was proceed, uh, going on in a clear transition. Uh, so the for the first wave eco-criticism and to the second wave of eco-criticism, you could see that uh, the first wave stopped and the second wave started. It, it was never so. It existed in in the same time and you could even um, uh, trace the first wave tendencies even today. So that is why many of these writers and academicians question this use of wave metaphor. So Lawrence Buell himself suggests rather than using a wave metaphor, a palimpsest would be more accurate in order to understand. So instead of a wave or clear, neat transition, you you have a layering rather that is all these movements all these tendencies are existing uh, at the same time so when I, when we talk about the wave metaphor you should also take it with uh, certain caution in the sense that it doesn't mean that now the environmental justice concerns are over now we are proceeding to something else no it is not so all these concerns are existing simultaneously, but in order to make sense of what is happening in this academic uh, inquiry, you, you can use the wave metaphor. So I want to put that disclaimer first. And uh, when you look at the third wave, and uh, before proceeding to the third wave, many of the eco-feminists have questioned this wave metaphor because uh, in eco-feminism, you could see that several of these concerns were taken up uh, by eco-feminists, uh, even in the early uh, 1970s or 80s, uh, much before it was, it, it was categorized under eco-criticism. So that is also there. Now proceeding to the third major development in eco-criticism. So after the ecological concerns uh, or eco environmental justice movement be uh, become a part of the eco-critical uh, inquiry, the next thing that happened was that it opened up the national boundaries or it opened up a boundaries of inquiry. So in the third way, uh, it the third wave recognizes the ethnic and national particularities and there was more of uh, all facets of human experience uh, were taken into account from or explored from an environmental point of view. So if the first and the second wave were, were more focused on the Anglo-American text and concerns, the third wave sort of opened up, opened it up to a world audience in the sense that uh, ethnic and national particularities. The local was also gaining a lot of importance uh, in the third wave of eco-criticism. Now, uh, within the third wave, you could see that there are there were a number of um, concerns developing uh, and uh, global conceptualizations around place and place-based identity formations uh, were explored. And at this point, what happened uh, or what was happening in ecofeminism was that due to the new material turn in, in, in theory as such, uh, the, the ecofeminists took up this material concerns to propound their own notions of uh, uh, gen gendered approaches in ecocriticism. So within, within the third wave, you could see that the material ecofeminism has sort of branched out to something else altogether, looking at uh, eco-masculinism and uh, green uh, queer theory, etc. So, taking the cue from this uh, development in ecofeminism, uh, there were and also the general turn to the general material turn within academia, uh, a new turn in uh, eco-criticism also began to develop, uh, especially in the late 2010s or, or late 2000s, early 2010s. Uh, so uh, this material turn was, is, is now the buzzword, as I said earlier, is, the, is one of the main concerns that uh, 
we talk about in uh, eco criticism and environmental humanities as such environmental humanities is uh, that branch of humanities which deals with a wide array of disciplines so we are talking about uh, uh, environment and history environment and psychology environment and uh, philosophy and all so it is a um, sort of like a interdisciplinary approach to uh, environmental studies that is environmental humanities so this material turn in hu uh, environmental humanities was part of this general turn uh, general material turn in academia as such so when we talk about the material turn we are questioning uh, the ideas of agency text and narrativity uh, so when we talk about eco criticism and uh, eco criticism's encounter with the material turn we are looking at how it has expanded and broadened our idea of agency text and narrativity so these three aspects or these uh, key terms will be explored uh, a little bit in in uh, this presentation so uh, going on to what exactly material eco criticism is uh, one might even propose that academic eco criticism is now uh, spawning a new mode of applied eco criticism which is uh, which is encompassing basic human behaviors lifestyle choices such as eating locomotion clothing and dwelling so uh, material eco criticism is part of that methodology and the movement in order to analyze our own lifestyle choices and the larger implications of our uh, lifestyle choices and uh, basic human behaviors uh, it as i said it covers a wide array of uh, discipline and uh, uh, why and if you look at this uh, seminal text in material eco criticism you could see that uh, it borrows several of its concepts from quantum physics and uh, other allied disciplines in uh, stem uh, and science in general so you could see that uh, eco criticism is uh, digging deeper into the idea of matter and agency or material agency so that is where uh, eco criticism is now not just something that is part of literature so the text uh, is now everywhere uh, as derida has coined there is nothing outside the text so the text is uh, everywhere anything can be read as a text and uh, it focuses on body and bodily practices the corporeal uh, and it is also about the discursive so there is this uh, encounter of the material where we have focused attention or we have this focused uh, interrogation into the body and bodily practices and we also look at its encounter with the discursive realm that is what uh, or these two are the uh, key focus areas of uh, material eco criticism so uh, now you might think why is it how is it different because uh, we know we have been talking about agency in, in our academic inquiries uh, long before that so how is it special now or how is it different now so the sociological accounts of material agency was uh, with respect to social relations but when material eco criticism talks about agency it expands its possibilities that emerge from the literal contact zone between human corporeality and more than human nature so if you read uh, cheryl glotfelty's introduction to eco criticism reader you will see that she expands the idea of the world from uh, social sphere to the entire uh, ecosphere right just like that the idea of agency uh, is not uh, narrow or it is not limited to social relations but it is expanded and uh, uh, for uh, 
expanded to the possibilities of all material agencies or anything that we come in contact with. So now you might think that how is it possible? Because uh, according to Karen Berard, who is one of the uh, key thinkers in uh, material eco-criticism, she is actually a quantum physicist and a feminist. Uh, in her book, Meeting the Universe Halfway, which was published in 2007, she talks about the agential realism or material agency. So she says that matter is not a blank state or immutable or passive but a doing or, or a congealing of agency. It is destabilize, stabilizing and destabilizing process of iterative interactivity. Of course, it's, it's a little hard to follow and understand, but basically what she means or what she uh, is trying to say is that whatever we come in contact with, be it animate or inanimate, it has its own agency. So uh, everything and anything we come in contact with has a uh, influence on our, us or has an impact on our bodies and our uh, identities. So you might think that, okay, this is an extrapolation. How is it going to work? Just uh, think about how uh, toxins work. Toxins are something that we cannot see something that we are not aware of because they are invisible to human eyes. Uh, and, but when we come in contact with the toxin, of course, our corporeal uh, system reacts to it. And due to that reaction, we become sick or we become fatally sick or we, be we have certain reconfigurations in our body due to this encounter with the toxin. So, uh, so that inanimate object or that uh, invisible object, not inanimate, it is animate in its own way, that uh, object or that matter has had an impact on our corporeal identity. So if you look at toxic disasters, uh, and other calamities altogether, you can see that once the toxins enter into an ecosystem, it not only destroys uh, the entire ecosystem, it also redefines the way in which we associate with the environment. For example, look at Hiroshima, the atomic bomb. After the dropping of atomic bomb in Hiroshima, people were sick and people were uh, sick for generations. So that nuclear uh, or that uh, something that has is as invisible because of course it is a spectacular and catastrophic disaster, but the mutations that happen are at nuclear level or at atomic level, which are invisible to human eye. So what material ecocriticism is trying to say is that whatever we come in contact with has an impact uh, on us and we have an impact on them because our own corporeality is dynamic. So there comes the idea of agency of matter. Material ecocriticism proposes basically two ways of uh, interpreting the agency of matter. The first one focuses on uh, matter's non-human agentic capacities and uh, represented in narrative text. So how these texts, how these narratives explore this uh, agentic uh, uh, realism. And the second way focuses on matter's narrative power. So matter also has particular way of generating meanings and creating configurations of meanings and substances. So how does that happen? That is what uh, material criticism focuses on. So in order to, uh, uh, I'll, I'll uh, wind it up in another two, three minutes. Uh, in order to have a concrete idea of what exactly material ecocriticism is, uh, one concept that is uh, proposed by Stacy Alain in her text, Bodily Natures, will come in handy. So her concept of transcorporeality, according to this concept, she says that uh, imagining human corporeality as transcorporeality in which human is always intermeshed 
with the more than human world underlines the extent to which the substance of human is ultimately inseparable from the environment so this is again uh, breaking or debunking uh, the nature culture binary uh, because there is nothing called nature and culture it is a mesh everything is in a uh, everything is in a constant change and everything is interacting with each other so it is not easy to define something as nature and something as culture and this is where donna haraway and bruno latour's idea of nature cultures also come into come in handy because there is a there is no neat category called nature or there is no neat category called culture so this is exactly what donna sorry uh, stacy alaimo is also proposing that human corporeality can only be so our body is not something that is uh, distinct from the environment our body is constantly in connection with the environment and it is it can only be understood as a continuum of the en environment so that is uh, what she says here transcorporeality stresses the continuity of body and environment interconnectivity replacing the dichotomy so these are the major works uh, if you want to uh, explore further on uh, material eco criticism which is a vast area it, it cannot be summed up in a 15 minutes uh, talk uh, so these are the few texts which you could use uh, to explore further on uh, material eco criticism so this is an edited work by stacy uh, sorry seremila uh Iovino and Serpil Oppermann. Then you have Body Natures uh, by Stacey Alaimo, uh, Vibrant Matter by Jane Bennett, and uh, Material Knowledge by Susan Hetman, and Becoming Animal by David Ebra. So these are the seminal texts in this area which you could use to further explore into material eco criticism as such. So that was a short uh, uh, presentation on material ecocriticism is too vast to discuss in a short span of time but uh, I hope I have given you some idea of what are the key concepts and what exactly this uh, uh, material ecocriticism is talking about along with a few thinkers uh, in this area that was my intention uh, of this talk that is just to make you aware of who are the key thinkers and where to look for uh, if you want to explore further uh, in the area of material eco criticism. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ma'am, you are on mute. Uh, thank you for that uh, very succinct uh, presentation on material eco criticism. But I think uh, to many of us who are new to it here, this will be a tough thing to understand yes. because those who are new to eco criticism will find it i mean totally uh, difficult but uh, the i mean the sum total of it is that you know uh, ecology i mean which is the base of uh, i mean uh, criti this criticism is i mean it it it, it takes its thing from science but uh, more than that you know anything that is battery anything that you you do right that also becomes uh, thing i mean that becomes a part of the i mean a material a material which can narrate so many stories to us and everything is interconnected the whole thing we are bringing even inanimate matter into it to say that all is one and oneness all we see ourselves in everything and uh, and I, it would have been if we have time at the end if you can take up some literary work which all of us know we can vibe with and tell us a little bit how you would go about that at the end okay and so can we go on to the next person is it sumati is it sumati or uh, debashri Sumati, yes, Sumati. okay. Sumati. Yes, Sumati is, yes. Uh, I mean, I know her from, I mean, long ago as a teacher. And at that time, she was working on her, uh, I mean, uh, doctoral degree. 
she was she was planning on eco criticism yes, and she did consult me i happened to be her chief in the evaluating i mean I, that's a place where we get to know many people and get to you know pass on such ideas also so i'm happy yes, that i met a met a person at at that kind of a place yeah. and today she it is was a, it was a pleasure ma'am to have a discussion yes. about all this so will stuff. you tell me you i don't have a bio note on you please tell me what you worked on and what you are going to speak on now and uh, my topic is about uh, eco psychology ma'am yes what did um, you work on um for you uh, that is uh, the connection between uh, ecology and psychology okay no no what did you work on for your uh, doctorate ah uh, eco criticism only ma'am children especially on children's literature okay uh, how okay. Uh, uh, through children's literature the eco critical concern uh, sorry concern is shown Mm, okay now you can go ahead with your uh, yes yes so, good evening all it's a pleasure to share the platform of in tandem with you all at this gorgeous evening first of all i would like to convey my hearty thanks to our revered principal dr uma mageshwari ma'am for the constant support for the success of our every endeavor in our college and i convey my hearty gratitude and heartfelt thanks to our beloved hod dr maria priti srinivasan ma'am who is an inspiring force to, to be dynamic forever in our department and outside actually in tandem and so many other clubs are the brain children of our uh, lovable madam maria priti srinivasan thank you priti ma'am and i feel happy to thank uh, the beacon of uh, in tandem dr rufus sir associate professor madras christian college chennai he is uh, known for nourishing in tandem with a variety of uh, subjects thank you rufus sir for your constant support my hearty thanks to our esteemed chairperson to dr srilatha ma'am head of the department retired selamal college chennai and many times uh, i had a chance to talk with uh, him and clarify the doubt uh, in relation to eco criticism and ma'am guided me uh, uh, it, uh, that itself was uh, an inspiration to go in depth about uh, eco critical uh, studies and uh, today it is a great opportunity to share with you all about a uh, eco psychology the term eco criticism though often being used it does stand antithetical to be hackneyed as it is getting its uh, rejuvenation at every diversion <coughs> sorry divergence so as the case of uh, eco psychology the offshoot of uh, eco criticism it has a drive the study of uh, eco or uh, the concept eco psychology has a drive to live in harmony with the natural world the study eco psychology is mainly to examine the emotional bond that exists inherently between human and uh, the physical world okay. human beings are as a matter of fact basically interconnected with the earth in all its life so the study helps to understand the complexity of uh, the bond you know and provides a solution to strengthen if ever the bond is succumbed to be in weaker position it has a potentiality to integrate the inextricable relationship between persons and the uh, planet uh, earth eco psychology Uh, uh, it's 
And the concept is propounded by Theodore Rosak. He felt that there is a wide gap between uh, uh, the human and uh, the earth. And uh, he was quite sorry about uh, the bond uh, that is not in good condition. Where is the gap? And how do we set right a gap? Why is it that a gap? And how do we resolve? All these are questions to resolve. Uh, according to uh, this uh, Californian professor who profounded uh, eco psychology, we can enliven the rejuvenating song of the earth with the help of uh, ecological unconscious. What is ecological unconscious? Why it is uh, essential now? In the postmodern world, we are increasingly dependent on uh, the capitalist uh, consumer society rather than uh, the natural world for our survival. We are now very crazy to identify ourselves with uh, the automobiles, newest uh, gadgets, and the latest uh, technology in the industrial commodified society. Nature is commodified into rags and pieces and they are making money out of that and uh, this commodified society and its domination and the ephemeral uh, comfort entrapped man and it repressed uh, of what uh, Rosa called us uh, ecological unconscious in their uh, psyche ecological unconscious is uh, almost uh, similar to what uh, Jung, Carl Jung called as uh, collective unconscious. The psychoanalyst Carl Jung believed that collective unconscious was an inherited collection of uh, knowledge and images that every human being had at uh, birth. But people are quite unaware of uh, the kind of uh, text contained in their collective unconscious. Our inner psyche is nothing but uh, the cornucopia of knowledge that we inherit from uh, our uh, uh, forefathers, inherit from the past. It is composed of archetypes. Due to ancestral experience, uh, everyone will commonly possess this knowledge of uh, precious knowledge of the past and uh, it can be tapped at the moment of a crisis. Whenever we feel ourselves that we are caught up in crisis, using that knowledge we can redeem, uh, uh, we can come out of such crisis. That is the preciousness of the past knowledge. Human mind in its subconscious is fundamentally interconnected with the subject of uh, nature that is the earth and all its uh, species but the dominance of uh, technocentrism in the modern society has repressed the biophilic of consciousness and therefore uh, the deep somewhere the in indigenous people nature lovers People, those who are living in uh, rural areas, ecosophers, they are all grieving about the natural beauties they had seen vanish in their own lifetime. It is also heartrending to the environmentalist in looking at uh, the magnitude of environmental crisis in which there is uh, an imminent death of uh, every other species. And every other day, the ecosystem is almost uh, looked broken. Therefore, it is an imminent need to stop this uh, devastation and uh, to redeem or to protect our uh, ecosystem. 
and to avoid uh, the environmental doom I, that is uh, our way of life uh, will soon bring down on us how do we come out of this environmental doom that is an imminent danger and uh, we are in jeopardy and this is uh, a crucial time and it is now acute need to reconnect ourselves with the nature to restore and to rediscover our ecological and conscious that is repressed in our psyche and this ecological and conscious is inextricable in the core of our psyche cannot be separated from us it is within us layers and layers of uh, 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 knowledge that we gained from nature is there in the depth but it is repressed therefore contemplative awareness of nature in the wilderness and other nature therapies definitely would impart strength strength and courage to retrieve ecological and conscious to know about it in its wider scale the study of eco psychology is instrumental as it is uh, very imperative and focuses on the emotional bond between human and uh, the earth eco psychology is uh, a new social and intellectual movement it uh, strives to understand and uh, harmonize uh, people's relationship with the uh, nature as an interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary the subject focuses on the synthesis of ecology and psychology and the promotion sustainability of all lives in the ecosystem it advocates for uh, some of uh, the valuable principles as adaptation communication creativity diversity decentralization relationship ages and parents and so on the collective use use of these principles in ecosystem ensures the change of whole universe to be holistic and the benefit of this uh, integration will be definitely far reaching eco psychology uh, as a study encompasses uh, as a study and concept it encompasses direct contact with the natural world it seeks to understand the complexity of these bonds and suggests paths to heal the weakened conditions embedded in the human nature of relationships it helps to relieve stress and heal any emotional trauma it strengthens the self confidence the nourishment of uh, ecological uh, self ecological self as it is getting nourished uh, while we are put in a uh, uh, that is imbibing lot of awareness about uh, nature and its well being and uh, the ecological self is uh, growing in our unconscious mind and uh, this uh, growth in its mature level is promoting ecological ego when repeatedly emphasizing for the values of nature which is uh, the stable state this is uh, this ecological ego is uh, the stable state of our uh, ego in its further growth it arguments for the protection of the whole nature another psychologist his name is howard kleinbell he uh, he also underpins that uh, such a deeply nurtured ecological ego generates eco bonding and uh, this bond encourages people to take care of uh, the earth professor rozaka um also states that in a broader sense as it grows it has or it reaches its uh, 
ethical responsibility to the safety of the planet. Eco psychology in its uh, holistic growth demands uh, a new cosmology which includes not only scientific models and understanding but also a spiritual teaching, ancient wisdom and the knowledge of uh, indigenous culture. And uh, this uh, valuable concept, ecological concept uh, can very well be illustrated uh, through Toru's uh, tremendous work of uh, Walden. Through this uh, seminal work, Henry David uh, Toru, he urges his readers to turn inward on immense journeys of uh, self-discovery. It is a sort of a uh, spiritual awakening where there is no avarice upon uh, the material bliss. And there, uh, interesting uh, uh, life uh, he was leading in Walden. Uh, Walden is name of uh, a lake. Actually, beside this uh, lake, uh, uh, Emerson was uh, owning the land. And uh, he provided that land to his uh, lovable, uh, desirable uh, Henry David Toru. And he stayed there for uh, two and a half years. Of course, uh, that is, he was alone leading his life in a uh, simple and humble uh, dwelling. But the Toru is not uh, actually in solitude there. In the Kazi icon, he was, uh, we can look at him as an individual in context. He was not alone, he was accompanied by so many other uh, creatures of a uh, species of nature. He knew very well, as long as he is uh, uh, an eco-critic and lover of uh, nature, uh, known for uh, egalitarian principles, he knew well how he must be very close to the land as possible. And he felt the rhythm of the soil, even at the very touch, the inherent truth there, and the wonders of wind, water, as he learned on its ways, its capacities, its limits, and all these that he enjoyed. In his uh, insight, uh, Toru could uh, make a uh, valuable uh, life in the rhythm of uh, nature. And he made the rhythm of uh, the nature as his own pattern of life. It's loss. He made it as his guide. And thus ultimately attained uh, the higher version of uh, the blissful nature. Of course, uh, Walden is known for biophilic richness. He leads uh, a simple meditative life with the plants, trees, birds, animals, insects, peasants, and every nuances of nature there. He lived his own life as he must. There was no compulsion, there was no domination, there was no dictatorship, nothing of the sort. There was no hierarchy between human and non-human. He was humble enough to learn from even little creature. He emphasizes the story of a bug to his readers through this uh, seminal work of uh, Walden. The story is about a bug which emerged from the wood of uh, the table after many long years. And uh, looking at that, he hopes that human beings will also likewise awaken and emerge very soon after a long gap of uh, years into a, uh, that as, uh, he was having the hope that uh, they would lead a new life, ideal life for uh, human beings would uh, live. This is what uh, that is, uh, uh, he looked at, he learned a lesson. On another occasion, when uh, uh, Tori climbed up uh, the top of main mountain, main uh, Mount uh, Katadin. Mount Katadin is uh, known for its natural beauty, and he was stunned by the bare solidity of uh, the rocks, and said, uh, he said like this, I quote, Think for our life in nature, rock, trees, wind, on our cheeks, the solid earth, 
the actual world, the common sense, contact, contact, what uh, that is this kind of uh, I unquote. This kind of mystic mystic experience, uh, okay, uh, he enjoyed it there. It was highly blissful to him there in that uh, Mount Katahdin. In Walden, he meticulously recorded his experience and uh, the philosophical implication of his uh, guest to find a more uh, meaningful uh, existence uh, in part. And uh, this remarkable work is a uh, personal declaration of uh, independence, social experiment, uh, and it is it is a sort of pilgrimage to find the ethics of uh, life that is abundant in nature. It is also a satire upon material culture and to a good degree, it is a manual of uh, self-reliance. Like uh, Toro, so many other persons, uh, of course, uh, Toro is uh, a transcendentalist like Emerson. And both Toro and Emerson had the same uh, mystic experience. Lord Buddha and uh, his life story, which is framed in nature and his great life for learning from nature after he is renouncing the material life is also due to ecological ego. And Tago, eminent uh, Indian uh, writer, uh, writer, the Nobel Prize winning, he also cherished the mystic force in nature. Like uh, uh, that uh, Tago, uh, like uh, these uh, transcendentalists, many persons also, enjoyed, especially the eco-sophers, those who are with the eco-consciousness, they enjoyed the blissfulness of our nature. Thus, the mode of ecological and conscious in our psyche, as Toru ensures, will pay synergistic value if everyone works for it, to give strength to such a psyche in our subconscious. Thank you, Anandra. No? Ma'am? Thank you, Sumati. I think uh, ma'am uh, will yes. join now. Yes. Yes. Have you finished, Sumati? Yes, uh, yes, 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 and thank you for that uh, seeing on eco uh, psychology. Yes, how that I mean, ego should yeah. enlighten, yes, yes. yes enlighten yes, our uh, lives, right? For yes, that eco consciousness, yes. So, yes, if you have, uh, I mean, any questions on it, uh, you can reserve it for the end, but I would, I, I uh, think. We will we'll be running short of time. We'll, I'll call on the uh, the next uh, speaker. Questions, uh, please give them at the end. Okay, at the you can have them at the end. The next person is Debashri Dattare from Jadavpur University, Kolkata. Yes, she's got. I mean, she's a very I think uh, another senior teacher like uh, Sumati, I think she's she's got uh, she's an associate professor in comparative literature and uh, I mean coordinator of Center of Canadian Studies and then uh, she's got Fulbright alumni award in 19 uh, taking her to uh, and then McGill University then after that fellowship at the University of Pavia Italy she was a Fulbright visiting lecturer uh, fellowship at Berkeley University Erasmus Mundus European uh, Europe Asia fellowship, taking her to Amsterdam and Fulbright uh, doctoral fellowship at State University of uh, New York Stony Brook. So I think a whole lot of research on post-colonial studies, environmental studies, indigenous studies. I think today she has she would be speaking on indigeneity, right? Indigenous people have a it's basically ecofeminism. Yes, broader yeah. ecofeminism. Indigenous people have a broad knowledge of how to live sustainably. Yes. Go. 
Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm very glad we are meeting in this way. And my thanks to Tandem and Professor Srinivasan for making it possible. It was a pleasure listening to my course panelists as well. I am going to speak about a niche area on uh, indigeneity. And I'm glad uh, Professor Sumati also mentioned indigenous communities and uh, how this works vis-a-vis -vis, uh, eco-criticism. And I'm also glad that Professor Krishna spoke about uh, the fourth wave. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a particular author that I have in mind, who's from Okanagan. And I'm looking into processes of resilience from the Okanagan, which is in British Columbia in Canada. And I'm looking into the works of a particular author, that is, it was uh, Janet Armstrong. And it's interesting to also look because I know because panelists, uh, Professor Krishna mentioned Latour and Haraway. So I think that would be on. If you could go into the first slide, please. The first slide. Nancy, Nancy could you share the slides for ma'am? I think, yeah, I think that. Yeah, Nancy would. Right, yeah, thank you. So this is, of course, what I'm talking about when you talk about indigenous knowledge systems. We are looking into the multifaceted ways of understanding indigenous knowledge in terms of local knowledge, agriculture, food, uh, food, nutrition, biodiversity, culture, performance, education, ethics, values, science, technology, elders, and local knowledge. And this gives me an opportunity to introduce, of course, Janet Armstrong, the person that I'm talking about because language, community, and land are the light motive in much of these writings by the Okanagan novelist, teacher, visual artist, and activist, Janet Armstrong. Uh, she has been an impassioned indigenous rights activist. She has been concerned with land rights, democratic rights, and improving the Aboriginal education system, especially in the context of the Okanagan Valley. So let me paint a picture for the Okanagan Valley, which is located in British Columbia in Canada. There are snowy slopes to the north, arid desert or antelope brush to the south. The southern valley is home to a diversity of unique flora and fauna, and the Okanagan people have historically relied on the southern valley of cottonwood trees for canoes and plants for medicine. So the valley and the life of the course represents a connection between the Okanagan people and the land that has sustained them for centuries. So the Okanagan, uh, so the Okanagan Valley deserves respect and care from its people for the services rendered over the years. It involves a sensitivity towards the ecosystem and towards a particular way of life, which involves the intermingling of the land language, which is the first language, I'll come back to this in a moment, and the Earth Mother language. That's what uh, that is what Armstrong tells us. As an Aboriginal person, therefore, it becomes imperative to contribute to the building of the community in order to ensure sustenance for future generations. Um, if we move on to the next slide, uh, please, you'll find that this is gives you a, a sense of the holistic perspectives in any kind of indigenous uh, research that goes on. So there is an emphasis on place, there's an emphasis on home, there is an emphasis on the sense of location. And of course, that involves a process of decolonization, a process of trying to indigenize perspectives on land, and this becomes very important because uh, in recent times, the pandemic uh, hit hit the country and hit, of course, all of us, as we know, as we've all been victims of the pandemic. And we remember talking to Armstrong and one of the things we asked her is that, how does the pandemic affect you? And her response was that, you know, communities like ours have been facing this for centuries. So we do understand what it means to be part of a community and to work with health hazards, to work with 
places where our lands are being taken away from us. So this is something that we understand. So it was something that was known to her. Um, and if you go on to the next slide, please. Uh, thank you very much for doing this for me. I really appreciate it. Um, if you look at the next slide, it gives you the importance of the importance of the radicalism of indigenity and how you can understand this, which is a divergence from Western models, how you understand that this is, of course, it tries to talk about the entire life cycle, um, entire life cycle in terms of seasons and everything else. And so for Armstrong, what she feels is that for the artist, it's a sacred responsibility to return the gift of cultural expressions in such a manner that the larger community is also benefited. So the community becomes most important. And I will talk about it in two of the texts briefly, I'll be uh, uh, in a moment. Uh, if you take on the next, if you look at the next slide, please, you will find that uh, you can look at the map. And this is, of course, the Okanagan, the Okanagan Valley, uh, very, very beautiful landscapes that you see. Uh, and then uh, what I wanted you to look at, this is the next uh, slide, which is the Eloquent Center. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, the Eloquent Center is one of the most crucial places of learning. If you look into the next slide, it will give you the logo. If you could please move to the next slide, Nancy. So it gives you a, a sense of the Eloquent Center. This is its logo, the Eloquent Center is a center, it began as a center for creative writing, but it became more as a center for creative indigenous resilience, indigenous agency. It's been there since 1989. It's one of the most thriving centers on working with indigenous systems of storytelling, indigenous knowledge uh, processes, and this, this is why it becomes uh, so significant. Uh, what's also important is that. Uh, as an Okanagan writer and activist, Armstrong's goal has been to educate and empower Indigenous communities because she believes that's the responsibility of the artist. And she has, of course, uh, been, uh, as an environmentalist, she has been concerned about the devastating effects of the world's depletion of natural resources. And it's something that she talks about in her second novel, which is Whispering in Shadows. Um, yeah. If you take a look at the next uh, image, we can see Armstrong Winger at the UBC campus. Uh, this is the University of British Columbia. This is Janet Armstrong, a uh, very, very phenomenal writer and activist. She's an elder now in the community. Uh, they've also started these indigenous learning centers, and these have been doing magnificent works. Um, if you go on to the next slide, please, uh, you will find that these are two of Armstrong's works. One is, of course, his first novel, her first novel, which is Slash, and Slash, and the second is Whispering in Shadows. Both of them are very important. Uh, Slash very briefly deals with a male protagonist. And it talks about his life during the Red Power Movement in North America. But what's important about Slash is that Armstrong wanted this to be uh, seen as a feminist novel. And of course, her resp the response to that was that, how do you call this a feminist novel? I mean, if you have a male protagonist. But her response was it was for the men to understand the healing power of the community, the healing power of the land. And what she begins is an understanding of soft power, or what she calls a soft power. And that begin, begins uh, the understanding of indigeneity in relation to the environment. Uh, Whispering in Shadow speaks about that environment. It speaks about a relationship with land. It speaks about a philosophical concept which is centered on the idea of all my relations. It means that as a person, one is responsible for everything that is there, animate and inanimate. So, if one were to work, uh, if one were to work in a way that is irresponsibly, and one would be told or admonished in indigenous, indigenous community that you're working, working in a way that shows that you have no relations 
right? So this becomes a very integral part of the text that I'm sure you guys uh, talk about. Um, I'm going to go, yeah, so this is something that I wanted to talk about, which is very important. This is the idea of uh, these concepts. Now, Simix, as you see on the slide, is a seed's word. It refers to the ecology of the land. It includes all life forms of a place, and it consists of many relationships. So the concept of Timix emanates from the Sikh's language, and it's illuminated in the oral story tradition. It, it's a word that allows access to the Sikh's concept of the human duty to nature. So when we unpack this word Timix, it allows us to perceive the depth of the Sikh's knowledge of ecology. It's a way to see existence in that Phoenix is the life force of a place. So what's happening over here, and this is where I wanted to come back to this idea of land speaking through language, is that you, you see the image in the word in the particular way that the Nishkishan uh, language as an indigenous language carries nature images. It generates meaning in that the word Timix literally displays many strands. And this is also why it's important to understand the seed's response to the moral issue of human utility of other life forms. It's also the foundation of an egalitarian type of governance that seeds practice. And it was extended outward in relations with other groups surrounding the territory. So Sikh's ecological knowledge can be seen in the judicious practices arising out of the wisdom that the ecology of their territory is a living whole system and it requires human compliance with its regenerative requirements in order to interact with it in a non-destructive way. So what's happening over here is that the Sikh social matrix would reveal knowledge that whole system generation is grounded in an ethic for which the fundamental requirement is non-destructive land use. How, how does Armstrong try to do this? How, how does uh, she try to look at it? And I'm going to end with these two processes that have been happening in the uh, their looping center. If you look at the second, uh, the next slide, you can see the looping center community space, and you can send and you can look at the final one, which is the. Um, if you look into the final one, you can look into the looping center where you have cultural mapping, where you have these stories being told about the one's connection to nature, one's connection to the indigenous person's relationship with the land is very important. And uh, that becomes uh, significant in much of Armstrong's works as well, because that is exactly what she's trying to do. Because it also involves an understanding of the community and how one works with the community and how one works with the idea of land itself. Um, I'm going to end this with a particular video, and if you could end the PowerPoint, and I'll just give me a minute and I'll show it. It should not take me long. Just give me a minute, please. This is Janet Armstrong speaking on the knowledge of space. So it's a four minute video. And we will end with that. Uh, Ma'am, is that okay? Do we have time for four minutes? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. All right. Okay. So we end with this particular video. The view from our mind. Uh, from the Okanagan mind, the, the view of land has more to do with um, the idea of how things interact at different levels in, in, in nature around us and how knowledge and learning has to do with understanding 
what those interactions are and how they, in a loop, return back to us in terms of how they impact us and understanding those as systems. And I know Fritjof is going to talk a lot more about that, so I'm not, and, and very much, in a much more knowledgeable way than I can talk about it. But it, it's very clear to me that, that, that learning in relation to that uh, process um, and learning from the natural world requires understanding systems and understanding how systems work and how systems loop back to yourself, even though you might seem to be removed from nature and you might seem to be removed from community. In other words, you might seem to be an individual, but you really are not. <laughs> and uh, you really are much more integrally and interconnected with those things and that the wisest learning process is to understand what those connections are and where we have to maintain and sustain our integrity um, in terms of transferring that learning to, uh, to our students. And I think in a lot of ways, when we as, and I'm speaking for Okanagan indigenous people, in terms of the way we think about land, we never have ever thought of it, I don't think, as anything static, as anything physical. Uh, we've always thought about it as a process of interactions, a process of change, and a process that's ongoing. As you know, um, you can talk about the land and all the things that populate the land, but you actually have to understand that for, for us, um, that in any of the four seasons, you have a whole different set of critters that populate the land or that are alive or awake or that are doing different things at different times. So it never is static. It, it always has a whole different set of things going on as a part of life. So understanding those systems and understanding and being part of that does something in terms of how com and displays and gives knowledge in terms of how systems work and how systems work really well. Um, because nature's been working really well for a long time. And so one of the things that uh, we think about as Okanagan people is how those systems should inform us in terms of our interactions and the principles that, that we, we need to think about and adhere to. So in the process of learning um, in our society, one of the things that we have come to understand is that there always needs to be that connection to from the individual and the connection to the family and the connection to community and the connection and how that inter intersects with the natural world that there needs to be a clear understanding of how that system works um, and it, there needs to be a clear understanding of how we as individuals are a part of that and so the learning process um, is is a multi-layered learning process that is modeled by experience, that is in, embedded in the language, that is embedded in the ceremonial process. So a ceremony isn't just about my, me and my connection to what I believe in as the creator, but ceremonial process is about the understanding that, that if I act in an ethical way and acknowledge something in, in, on the land as a being, being an essential part of me and being an essential part of that mystery of creation, that that ceremony is a process of learning and embedding that ethic and that idea. Yes, thank you, thank Dr. Devashree. Yes. I, I have a, a question. I have a question. I want to know something. more. See, language, yes. the language is that which embodies the culture and all. Do yes. these children listening to stories, do the younger people or that, are, are they learning the Okanagan language Absolutely. or is it English? No, um, thank you. Thank you for that question because it's a wonderful uh. question and I'm very excited because you see, uh, what began in the 1990s was the Okanagan School Curriculum Project. And people like Janet Armstrong and others said that if you want to have the revision, you need to have people like us. You need to have Okanagan community people. 
we don't see why an, only an English speaking person should, should come and speak to us. So this is what generated it. And definitely all these storytelling uh, processes happen majorly in the Okanagan language. English may be used, but Okanagan mm -hmm. is, uh, it's a revitalization of endangered languages as well that work. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, because in India, we have so, all our indigenous, have you worked on all the, I mean, indigenous people of India? Yes, the, actually I have. Uh, I, uh, I work on Northeast India, so I work with the community in uh, Assam, which is Fabian Young, and that was what my favorite al alumni project was on. Mm. So I worked with uh, weavers and women weavers in Fabian Young, and we did this workshop with three generations. Mm. Of Are there, I mean, our indigenous systems, I mean, their knowledge yeah. intact, has it been, is it being handed over to the uh, next generation? With the yes, same reverence. It is, yes, hmm. it, it is being done to a large extent. So, for example, if you could think about the tribal academy, which is in uh, Gujarat in Tejgur, uh, which is like hmm. around uh, a two hour drive from the Madodara, it's been doing phenomenal work with communities there. And uh, so, there have been work, there has been work that's happening across as well. And for example, Karbi Long, we have the Karbi Center for the Center for Karbi Studies, which is associated. And one of the things that we lay emphasis on is the revitalization of these communities, recordings, archiving, digitizing, and things like that. So that's been happening. In your own place, I think Mahashweta Devi did. I worked on her. Yes, so I yeah, said, yeah, yes, I worked on exactly this. I mean the systems of knowledge they have and how it's how it is. I mean yes, and the, yes. on the chapter called ecofeminism, I did this. Yes. So for me, this these areas are. I mean that's that's yes. very familiar. Yes. So this is. Uh, I just I wanted to know they they don't use. You no, know, we don't hear about Okanagan language. Whereas no. uh, here we have a script. Uh, here in India yes. uh, there are scripts for right. their own language. It's being yes. promoted. Yeah, I just wanted right. that. Yes, absolutely, that is mm. And so, I'm glad that you mentioned Marshwata Devi as well because she mm. has done such. Yeah, she has done. Work. Yes, she has done a lot of work mm. on that. So, yeah. Yes, uh, the Thank floor you. is open for questions on all the three papers and uh, i think uh, each one can comment on the other's papers also if you have anything to add uh, something positive to add to each of these papers please do even the uh, i mean even the uh, participants because i mean only this particular material eco criticism i found it new i do not know if everybody uh, has worked on that but uh, the others are a little older so it is new um, even for me ma'am because in india material eco criticism is coming to mm. there there are in many research papers on material eco criticisms coming mm. because as you mentioned in the beginning because you have several of uh, terms used from science mm. especially from quantum physics and things it is not easily accessible uh, in order to understand but mm. i will put it in some simpler terms uh, in in uh, in the way that i have understood it mm. for example if we take a deceased body uh, for example let's take a deceased disabled body from bhopal mm. which is uh, which is actually what indra sinha's animals people is talking about it's a novel uh, by uh, on bhopal tragedy but it is placed in this fictional town of kofpur the title mm. of the novel is Animals People mm. uh, by Indra Sinha. So it is based or inspired by Bhopal tragedy. So when you look at a deceased body uh, or a deceased body due to this uh, toxic catastrophe, the body and the need and the environment are both destroyed. So the body is not seen or read in isolation. The body becomes a continuation of the environment of which it is part of. Then now when we talk about this material uh, interaction between body and the environment, because the body is sick because the environment is also toxic, right? So when you look at this uh, toxic interaction, it is not just the environmental connection that we are trying to link. When we talk about the discursive 
uh, encoded in the material we are talking about the political we are talking about the social we are talking about the economic so who are these people who are disabled or who are these people who are called the victims what are their social or political uh, connection or identity altogether so when you look at a deceased body from a toxic uh, catastrophe you are reading that body not just in connection to its disease but also in connection to the several socio political uh, processes of which it is part of so when you read a body or, or a text on uh, a bhopal catastrophe uh, bhopal cast tragedy you are not just talking about uh, something uh, a disease which is a part of an environment which is due to an environmental catastrophe you are looking at that body or the body represented in the text as a text itself okay so this text is the product of uh, the material the political the economic and the social so there are several discursive realms coming into play when we read the body as well so if you look at um, uh, any 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 envir environmental disaster for that matter how will you know that okay this disaster has affected this population it is when they become sick we need certain spectacular manifestation to understand that okay this has affected uh, this particular population right which rob nixon calls a slow violence uh, so there the body itself becomes a text of the multiple uh, agencies around us why the body is sick because the body interacted with the material uh, uh, agencies outside so the body itself become a text of the meanings that these material interactions bring so uh, the material eco criticism is trying to bring all the nuances of material interactions so when we read a uh, text based on hiroshima or um, chernobyl or bhopal we are looking at how the body is represented and what are the political the social and the other implications that come in when we read this body as a representative of that particular environment Uh, ma'am you are on mute yeah are you making any judgments like mm. this one is wrong or that one is right like so far we were talking about the anthro man being the uh, problems yes now now you tell about that bit also in this okay. yes. so here we are not talking about um, yes we are debunking the idea of anthropocentrism that man being the center of agencies mm. but rather we are not um, removing the human factor mm. but we are identifying human factor as one of the many agencies around us yes so it is not a, it is definitely a de centering of human agency in the sense that we are not looking at hierarchies or we are not looking at uh, a particular power relation but rather we are acknowledging that yes there are several agencies around us which are equally powerful which may not which we may not realize yes okay so this is, is a very i i know this has this is quite uh, mind blowing to take in one hour no it i mean it's... it makes sense after a time only thing is whatever we have always been in indian uh, culture right we never saw dualisms right yes. in the first that bit it i think it has come back because in nature there is not that that divide is not there so we have brought back the essential quality of the scene to i think when we are talking about material eco criticism that is what i felt when i read as yes. you read this uh, one only one or two of those seven essays that's yes. what i felt i have not yet read any work that's why i asked you to give me an example okay i have not read any yes. work relating i mean relating this theory to some text yes thank you i i i think does anybody else in the group have anything to ask on this paper or comment or uh... yeah i'm sita Yes, uh, when I was listening to you, uh, you can let me know, Sunny, as I've gone got it wrong. 
And I was listening to you, I was reminded of uh, Robin Hook's novel, Fever, where, you know, this person has fever and then the investigations uh, show that uh, it's uh, related to uh, a plastic recycling plant located nearby and then and there are many novels which fall into this pattern. So, would you agree or disagree that we should study uh, such narratives? Yes, yes. It is very important to locate these narratives, with not just within the socio-political context, but also within the environmental context. For example, in in uh, US and in Europe they are uh, trying to locate why certain communities are selected as waste yards and why certain communities are selected for toxic dumping. Uh, uh, Shrilata ma'am, you are on mute. Did you say uh, something? No, no, no. That's what I wanted you to bring in that agency also. Also that uh, Hume, I mean, uh, what is it? The other uh, factors like, you know, rivers and uh, uh, the environment per se becoming an agency. Yes. Like in uh, Heart of Darkness, the river, right? Uh, that also, please. Uh... Yeah, so yeah, so basically, material eco criticism, as uh, Srilata ma'am mentioned before, it is trying to uh, debunk the idea of human centrality, that is, humans are the all powerful beings in the universe, but rather we are part of several agencies which are equally powerful. For example, the toxins or uh, the electrons or electrical uh, impulses that we are, that are, that are all around us, it is equally important. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly share some, uh, I mean, it will take just uh, a minute. Uh, I hope you can see this, the highlighted passage. Can you see it? Uh, is it visible? Yes, it is. Yeah. So this is uh, from uh, Greta Garat's uh, uh, collection on uh, uh, international perspectives in ecofeminism. Uh, so here, uh, and this particular essay is taken from uh, uh, Serenilla uh, Iovino's uh, uh, contribution to the collection where she talks about uh, the bodily landscape is part of the interconnected agencies. Ecological risk and crisis appear with many faces, some of them directly tied to country social structures, gender practices, power relations, and others con uh, concretely incorporated in forms such as structures, practices, and relations which, is, uh, which assume within the historically stratified uh, ecologies of spaces. So when we look at uh, uh, a text, we are looking at the multiple agencies uh, uh, which actually led to the production of the text itself. Agency to me is a kind of, uh, mm, I won't say disturbing word, it's uh, bothering me a bit. Because, because uh, our idea of agency <laughs> yeah, comes from like that. They, I was wondering what this agency is when I read that article. It was it was disturbing. It, yes. Yes. It, it is. It is disturbing. Theory, too much of theory is disturbing to me. Actually, it is, this, disturbing this is terribly theoretical. It is okay. disturbing, especially when we are thinking about it as from a sociological relation. Hmm. But when we talk about agency in a rather uh, expansive realm, we will be able to understand that agency is not just about power relation or hierarchical relation. It is also about, as Deleuze and Guattari talks about, the rhizomatic yeah, relationship. Rhizomatic. Yeah. So agency is not as terrible as theory has made us believe. It It is also about expanding our idea of how I think they, ecological interconnections work. Yes. They need to use that word because Human, non-human, batteries, electric, I mean, electrical impulses, everything becomes agencies. So naturally, they have to use the word there. Uh, to that me, in simple terms, uh, it would be globalization, pollution. Yeah, yeah they, are, <laughs> they are taking capitalism. Uh, capitalism, yeah. Yes, yes. Eco cosmopolitanism. Uh, what yes, do they call cosmo, it? Uh, yeah, eco, eco cosmopolitanism. Cosmopolitan. 
so our idea of place itself is going on a radical change because of the global exposure that we have and uh, in order to contextualize everything we need to since we are also engaging in a very uh, uh, expansive larger notions we also need to take in even uh, even the minutest into consideration because then even when our engagements become expanded and uh, uh, ex uh, expanded in a larger sense uh, in a global sense uh, we should also try to narrow it down and see how we are also uh, engaging in the minutest level possible because our its implications can be global i'm a little worried that uh this uh, theory would you know expand to i do not know i think it has reached the world right and become because everything has become one there is no uh, i mean uh, there is no need demarcation between anything okay all agencies are uh, one so anything can be detrimental or uh, good to the other etc etc so i'm just wondering where eco uh, criticism is moving from just when the it, when it when i very... just said everything is connected to everything else the first line in ecology when i started in when i started working on eco criticism in the 2000s it has come a long way from that and but yet it is still there right everything is still connected to everything else yes anything more uh, on the third paper uh, miss uh, dr debashree's paper any questions or clarifications yes dr rufus i think i don't hear him at all somewhere is he is dr rufus there yes yes ma'am uh, yes, yes ma'am i've been uh, listening uh, to all the i theme. thought you were at mcc deeply involved with uh, uh, eco criticism yes ma'am yes having great morning, stalwarts uh, uh, there yeah this morning also in my second class i told about the seemings program and i was talking exclusively about you saying you know how as a retired professor she still has the passion so i want the my students to come and listen to you especially and i'm so happy my students are there you know, <laughs> no i don't know i am also learning right i am no, also yeah. learning i still want yes, to yes, be yes, yes. No, that's true still you now harini is there kail bili susan many i'm so happy to see them and uh, the the evening was very enriching in every way like anchita krishna she spoke uh, very well you know some new insights we could garner uh, the same with uh, sumadhi ma'am also and uh, the last one uh, was really really good debashree ma'ams and uh, especially yeah uh, especially you know uh, i just have a point there like she was talking about mahashweta devi i i would like to know uh, her views on uh, gn devi also in this regard because uh, i think when she spoke about gujarat it was uh, referring to devi's uh, place yeah, uh, dr debashree yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, right, right, right. Okay, ma'am. Uh, yeah, so inspiring, all the three. You know, you all made our evening very interesting. So thank you. Very rewarding you. evening for us. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I have a request to Sri Lata, ma'am, and Rufa, sir. Mm. Um, yes. Give you know, uh, the, our two guests for the evening are from outside Chennai, so outside Tamil Nadu. Yes. So could you share something about our own? Uh, Uh, Tinai. Yes. Uh, if they have not heard about it and the work that yes. uh, Dr. Nirvan Selman Mani has done, I'm not sure. Ah, uh, you do. Yeah. You do teach Tinai in. Yeah, yeah. We teach Selman poetry for. Okay. 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 But I would love to hear from you. Yeah, I still okay. when uh, when uh, I had uh, to. I mean, uh, when I was with Dr. Nirmal Selman Mani. who propagated yeah. okay, the idea here i think he made it popular he wanted to so many people have written about this uh, oldest language in the world and the oldest eco critical method 
in the world also written okay i think one of the oldest eco critical methods that we have it is uh, embedded in our uh, into the tamil culture so we i got to know i see i was a student of uh, uh, main malayalam and uh, hindi and i never got to know tamil much but i have listened to my uh, i mean uh, friends in school to wonder me and his, right is form of eco poetry i think tamil uh, uh, tamil culture still continues to have that same aspects in some uh, of in its uh, in uh, in its uh, poetry tradition even today uh, that rhetorical uh, thing but then not that what you call we have lost a lot of sense of the environment uh, i think it happened in some dark middle ages so we we have to yet come back and connect that like all indians we too have to connect to the environment uh, again and give importance yes and it is possible with material eco criticism and other kinds of i mean other uh, the other all the other various positions in uh, in uh, eco criticism so i'm so happy that eco criticism i chose right to do my thesis on all those uh, eco critical positions that's gaining a lot of importance yes uh, rufus sir you can have some uh, saying add about Uh, about this you are the place from where eco criticism started and got uh, its uh, uh, saying impetus yes ma'am thank you so much for that yes dr nirmal salomani pioneered eco criticism in the 1980s right from madras christian college and uh, there an article the other parts of the nation would, wouldn't have known that much just an outline because i'm not fully equipped for that you know it's about region region specific characteristics the occupation the presiding deities the 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 cultural life of the people there the environmental conditions how they all coexist the interconnectedness uh, you know if we could use the word cosmic interconnectedness that prevails there so the five things that we have kurunji mullai marudam uh, neidal and pali the different landscapes and how they celebrate their own landscapes the region something that you know bioregional studies advocates yes, today yes 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 that is so sir, is that article available in english or is it in tamil yes ma'am uh, he has come out with monographs as ma'am has rightly said he has come mm. out with tinai 1 tinai 2 and tinai 3 i can pass it on to you also i think it's on angelfire.com okay exactly angelfire wonderful to look at it yes yes angelfire.com you go to that yeah. site okay and you will get uh, tinai 1 2 3 all right i'll all the articles yeah which is non particular in tamil but not as good as to read a research paper mm. so that is the fit in your place in at the university yeah, yeah. you yes, are at a we, university yeah okay we yes, we were yes, uh, yes. yes we were yes. all we are all from uh, small colleges <laughs> <laughs> right i i worked with the pachepas group uh, one of the colleges of the pachepas group you must have heard of the pachepas college yes, but sir. you would not have heard of chelamal college which is one of the uh, colleges under that trust i i retired from there so but uh, my interest in uh, nature nature right all these things continued i think that was what led me to work on a uh, person like mahashweta i mean devi right she is not from the oppressed standpoint but i just uh, i mean i say sustainability is and uh, what is that uh, consumption uh, all those uh, eco justice right i didn't use the word eco justice the sustainable futures for the people of uh, i mean people in uh, for the tribal people what she worked for right so i looked at it like that so there are uh, plenty of people working i think uh, on the tribal communities here and also i mean so that is eco feminism now everybody wants to do on just uh, you know uh, environment for the, i started reading environmental texts I go ha uh, Gadgil Shivaram Krishna these were the people mm-hmm. I started reading then of course the mm-hmm. nomad call thief before I started with Mahashweta Devi 
I, I mean, actually, all these people I read and all these folklores on environment, right? Take care of and the flowering tree and all yeah. this. This, yeah. this only led me to the, uh, this, uh, I mean, to this area. So I'm happy that more and more people are, uh, I mean, working on it. This area that Sumati dealt with, eco psychology, I think is a little, uh, very few people get to work on uh, that uh, that area. Very few people in, I think, uh, amongst the people who come uh, asking for help and all, only very few people take up that. Eco spirituality, yes, we we have to deal with all the, uh, that I think that term applies to almost all the uh, tribal groups all over the world. All the, uh, I mean, Australian or uh, Canadian, American, all all those Latin American, all those eco spirituality we get to know. So I'm very happy to have been here listening to all of you. Then that that there are so many people taking it forward, and I think Maria Preeti can. Uh, yes, up. I have to. I just would like to express my appreciation to Dr. Debishree. Uh, I'm a body in. And actually, an Aboriginal woman, my side of the business. Yeah. And so, like that, like Brody's narrative, there are many, which uh, where the um, right. And, uh, yeah. Both so, you know, I don't know. Uh, there, there will be that hair splitting differences. Mm. Okay, psychology is something deeper uh, than the, the, the spirituality refers to the, all the religious practices of the uh, other rituals, isn't it? So I think Debashri can tell us. Uh, the the, the higher realm of uh, psychology, man. the higher realm of, uh, realm of psychology. But spirituality, mm. yeah? Yeah. Well, one less, uh, okay, no, okay, the, one psychological, less. the psychological bond is uh, uh, when it is intensified and uh, we are reaching to the higher realm and uh, in that... Uh, 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 place we are uh, getting the bliss of uh, uh, God that is uh, that is otherwise okay. called as uh, spirituality. Uh, you know? All right, bliss right. Of nature, yeah. yeah. Okay, in I thought redeem, it the other in way. In the rudimentary stage, we have to show our love and the connection with the land, and as we are nourishing uh, that uh, continuously, and it is growing up with the uh, uh, ego and with the intensified uh, ego, still we are connecting ourselves with the nature and uh, 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 sort of sublimation we will get it. And there lies the spiritual bliss, man, okay. enjoy. Yeah, spiritual joy is there. Uh, okay, okay. Both are one to one connected, man. Uh, okay. <laughs>